Welcome to the Lady Landlords Podcast, where we empower women to gain financial independence through real estate investing. I'm your host, Becky Nova, founder of Lady Landlords. If you're ready to buy, manage, and grow your real estate portfolio, then let's get started. Welcome back to this week's episode of the Lady Landlords Podcast. Today, I am joined by Elise Osenwald who is the global investment strategist at JP Morgan. And we're going to be talking all things that you need to know about the economy now in 2023. So Elise, thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate you taking time out of your day to, to meet. How are you doing? Doing great. Very happy to be here. Thank you for having me on. Of course. You know, we are a women's organization. I would just love if you could just take a minute before diving into the work, the economy, all that, if you could just share a little bit about who you are with our listeners. Sure. So I'm Elise. I grew up in Indianapolis, Indiana, and went to school right outside of Chicago at Northwestern University, where I met my best friends and the love of my life. Uh, shortly after graduating, I moved to New York City to take this job with JP Morgan. Um, been living here for about seven, eight years now. Am married to an ear, nose, and throat surgeon. We've got a little dog named Debbie. So I spend a lot of time going to Central Park, walking the dog. I love to cook, which I'm grateful for. It's a productive hobby, uh, which is nice, especially given how busy the past year has been, given what's been going on in markets and the economy. And that's about it. Thank you. I, I know our listeners are going to ask this question. What kind of dog? <laughs> so... She's a mutt from okay. Korea. We got her through this awesome organization that kind of specializes in rescuing dogs off of the streets of Seoul and other parts of South Korea. So she is a Jindo mix. We actually did one of those DNA tests. So she looks like a like tiny blonde little fox, kind of. Oh, very cool. Thank you yeah. for sharing. So global investment strategist, break that down for us. What is that? Sure. So. It is a fancy title to describe a job that entails thinking about what's going on in the global economy and also global markets, using those insights to come up with what JP Morgan Wealth Management's house view is going to be. And then my primary function on this team is to go out and spread the gospel of how we're thinking about those things on behalf of our clients. So I think a lot about the macro economy, but also things like stocks, bonds, and alternative assets, including real assets like real estate. Fantastic. Now, how long have you been involved in this? Was that since you graduated college when you moved to New York City? Not quite. So given kind of the public facing nature of this role, it's something that I've come into um, really starting when the pandemic started was when I was able to level up and kind of enter the global investment strategist role. But I've been working in JP Morgan's investment solutions business for about seven years now. And along the way, have just learned a ton and kind of, you know, cut my teeth with various senior leaders, trying to act as a sponge, like absorbing all of these insights. And then ultimately now going forward and sharing them with folks like yourself. Great. Thank you. No, that's why it was such a great fit to have you on the podcast. Um, was this something that you always kind of wanted to do? How to, Like in this role, was that, you know, I mean, I'm, as a young woman, were you saying like, great, can't wait to work at investment strategy? <laughs> well, or... yeah, like perfect question, because the easy answer is no, because 10 years ago, I don't think I knew that a role like this even existed. And I feel very lucky that it does exist because it's kind of at the nexus of what I'm good at, what I'm interested in, and also what I'm passionate about, which is making mm -hmm. these insights about the economy and markets feel approachable and empowering for folks. Um, I got into finance in the first place, to be honest, because graduating from college, I was an econ major. I had student debt, so I was like, okay, what job could I take that's relevant to economics that's going to help me pay off that student debt really quickly? I was like, I guess I'll go into finance. And I chose wealth management because I loved the kind of interpersonal component and the relationship building uh, part of this. Mm -hmm. But once I was on the desk actually doing the job, really found 
a, a really acute interest in how markets worked and kind of what influenced them. Um, mm -hmm. And my mom always says that I have the gift of the gab. So when this team started getting built out and when I learned that it largely focused on having to write and communicate a lot, I said, mm -hmm. that sounds perfect for me. And then the rest is kind of history. That's how I wound up here. That's great. I love kind of seeing those like career progressions that women yes. go through. And that's so fantastic too, that you ended up finding a role that kind of was just so tailored to your personality and your skills. That's exactly. really rare. So I am, I'm happy that you found that. Not everybody's as lucky, but that's, that's Thank really you. great. Um, that's I what know. we all kind of aspire for. Um, yeah, I feel very lucky. So good. Um, so, I mean, this is going to be a really broad question, but let's start there and then we'll kind of break it down. But what do you think of the economy for 2023? <laughs> what should, right? Like, I mean, I'm throwing like this huge, yes. massive question at you. So why don't we kind of start with maybe just kind of like in general, some of like the trends that you feel like we'll kind of see, and then we can kind of break them down a little bit. Maybe that's the best way to kind of attack, you know, this huge Perfect. question here. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. So I think it's helpful to kind of flash back to 2022, the year that was, because for a lot of folks, that was the year that was really scary. And it felt mm -hmm. like over, you know, the, the months of the year, this consensus of everyone starting to expect recession was building and building and building. That mm -hmm. to us was a direct reflection of what was going on with inflation and also how the Federal Reserve, our central bank, was responding to inflation. So mm -hmm. what we went through last year was the most aggressive Fed interest rate hiking cycle that we had seen in over 40 years. So this was kind of like a like whiplash effect for investors, but also for people like you and me, right? Consumers or, mm -hmm. you know, folks that are trying to go about their business and make decisions about the future, particularly as it pertains to investing. So now that we're entering 2023 and kind of looking ahead and trying to figure out what this calendar year might hold, we mm -hmm. think that what we saw play out in 2022 in terms of what the Fed did and how much you saw interest rates rise, this is when it's all going to come home to roost. So okay. we haven't yet seen that many segments of the economy outside of the housing market slow down substantially. But by the end of this year, we do think that we're going to see that economic weakness start to broaden out and ultimately lead to a recession in the United States. Um, again, this is something relatively consensus at this point. I think a lot of folks think we're already in a recession or they have faced the reality and kind of digested the fact that one is probably coming. And that's scary for a lot of people, especially right. when we consider the last few recessions that we've gone through, which were the virus crisis, the global financial crisis, and the tech bubble in the early 2000s, all of which were like massive, you know, periods of pain and economic fallout. We don't right. think that this particular recession is going to be proportional to what we went through in the last three. Gotcha. I'm running out a ton of questions to kind of break that down here. Perfect. First, first place to kind of start, um, what caused this massive inflation that we've been seeing? Why is that what we're experiencing at this point in time? Really, really good question. And it's actually helpful, I think, to contextualize how I think about inflation in general, which is to break it down into three different categories, right? So first category is goods-based inflation. And I'm starting with that one because it's actually what got us into this mess in the first place. If we think back to where we were 2020 and just what day-to-day -day life was, we of course couldn't go out to restaurants, we couldn't get on airplanes to go on vacation. And so we were sitting in our homes and all of a sudden had this insatiable appetite for stuff. So consumers were spending a ton of money on goods and you combine that like ballus of spending with what was going on with global supply chains, which were a total mm -hmm. wreck. And it caused this goods-based inflation to absolutely explode, okay? okay? Since then, we've actually seen consumers start to rotate their spending and normalize that spending away from the goods sector towards more of the services, which I'll get into in a second. But as that's happened, you've also seen supply chains normalize. You know, shipping costs, for example, are down 70% from their highs. And so inflation today actually really isn't being driven by this goods component anymore. Now, the baton has been passed to the other two categories, one of which is shelter, 
okay, relevant to our conversation right now. It's a mm -hmm. big part of where the average Americans, you know, monthly dollars kind of get allocated to. And it's a particularly sticky source of inflation because when things like rental prices go up, you know, let's just like take a one year lease as an example, you're going to be locked into that price for the next 12 months. And you're not going to see those prices reset until it's time to, you know, renew or find a new lease. And so right now, shelter inflation is kind of what's driving overall inflation when we break down the components of something like the consumer price index. But you've also got other services excluding shelter that are also, you know, still kind of stubbornly high and placing some upward pressure there. That piece of inflation, this third category, the services mm -hmm. component, we think is very heavily related to what's going on in the jobs market. So there is still not enough supply of workers for the amount of open jobs available. And what's mm -hmm. that, what that's doing is pushing wages higher. It's good news for you and me, right? Like if we're getting a paycheck every two weeks or every month and we want to go out and spend that. But if you're someone who's running a company and you've got to pay these people, that means that your costs have gone up. And so what those companies have been doing mm -hmm. is passing the higher cost on to consumers. And that's like created the overall inflation. Um, looking forward, we are optimistic that inflation is going to cool. Part of this is because we're seeing some normalization of those pandemic era dynamics. Part mm -hmm. of this is a function of what the Fed has been doing, which is very intentionally trying to slow economic activity down. You know, they want you and I to not feel incentivized or compelled to take out a loan and buy a house or, you know, take out a loan and invest it in our business. And we think that ultimately they're going to be successful in that goal, but unfortunately that it's going to have some side effects and that you know, headline side effect is that we're probably going into recession in the second half of this year. Okay. When you mentioned those three categories, can you mm -hmm. talk a little bit more about what falls under that umbrella of services? I think goods are very clear to understand clearly than totally. the, the real, the housing shelter, that one I think is going to make most sense to our listeners, but what kind of falls under services? Sure. So it's everything from your haircuts to the cost of going and getting a mani-pedi at the salon, um, airfares, things like that. Everything that's not a tangible good that you can like buy and hold in your hand. And also anything that's not like housing, the roof over your head. Perfect. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. That's what I thought you meant, but want to make sure that yes. we're all clear. So thank you for breaking that down. Um, you got it. You said something in there about how how with what the feds are doing right now is that they're trying to kind of decentivize us from mm -hmm. this economic growth. I mean, this might be a little question, but is, is that an overall good strategy of a government to suppress growth? Yeah. So <laughs> look, I, I try to take as objective a perspective as possible and think mm -hmm. through not like a moral judgment of is what they're doing good or bad, but rather a more objective perspective that says, will this actually be efficacious in that mission? Um, mm -hmm. Nonetheless, I'll try to answer your question more directly. <laughs> like inflation is not good for the economy. Because particularly, like, let's think about, you know, some of the lower income demographics or the lower wealth demographic. Mm -hmm. the, the, like, rising costs are more punitive and painful for them than they are for wealthy people who have money invested in the stock market or who already own real estate property and, and have, like, a lot of, you know, value tied up in these very tangible assets. And so... The Fed recognizes that for the sake of long-term economic stability, they've mm -hmm. got to bring this inflation figure down. I think the unfortunate thing and the way that their hands are kind of tied is they don't have a ton of options. And it's not <laughs> like they have these very surgical instruments to say, oh, this particular piece of inflation is the problem. And so we can isolate our approach and only try to like get that particular component down. Instead, they're working with this very blunt instrument that is it, their policy interest rate, which of course is the like foundation of the pricing of every financial asset in our economy. And they mm -hmm. know that the only way that they can kind of influence what's going on with prices 
is to yeah. really influence what's going on with demand. And the way that they do that is by increasing or decreasing the cost of capital, depending on what it is they're trying to accomplish. So when you're talking about increasing the cost of capital, is that where that hike in interest rates comes in? Yes, okay. exactly. Like the ability to borrow is like oxygen for the economy. Because again, going back to that, that example, when you think about your decision-making process as a consumer, like mm -hmm. let's use a different example other than borrowing to invest and just think through how over the course of the past few years, if you were to hold your cash in a savings account, it barely was earning anything because interest rates were so low. But today you can look at investments and put your cash in a savings account or a certificate of deposit or even like treasury bonds and actually earn something on that money. So all of a sudden I don't feel so bad about letting my cash just sit there instead of going out and spending it in the economy. So it kind of works both ways by incentivizing us to save and also disincentivizing us to borrow and invest and spur more demand and economic activity that way. I was actually going to ask about that because I find, I find it so interesting. A lot of us over the past couple of years, though, I always like made this joke about like, you know, can we really call a high yield savings account high yield when yeah. I'm getting like, you know, 0.2 on my money. So it's really interesting now is we're seeing like impending recession, um, inflation at like record highs, interest rates, record highs. Um, and then all of a sudden I'm getting like my bank mailing me, emailing me being like, Hey, your rate's going up. And I'm like, really? Like that's, it's such like a weird, um, totally. that it's really interesting. So I was, that was actually one of my questions for you. So I love kind of then hearing you say that really what the, the, as we're hiking rates for what it costs to borrow money, we're then saying, Hey, listen, if you keep your money in savings, we're going to actually give you a little bit extra. You're going to have a better reason to want to be able to hold on to that capital during this time. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah. And it's not something, oh, go ahead. No, 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 please. I was going to say, it's not something that we're used to in recent memory. You know, like low interest rates were kind of the dominant theme of the post-global financial crisis era. And now after, you know, this monetary policy episode where the Fed, but also central banks around the world ripped interest rates higher, we've got the highest interest rates and the ability to get paid the most for doing something like buying a treasury bond and lending money to the US government, even for a relatively short period of time, like two years, you can actually earn something. And, and that you know earning stream is the highest that it's been in over a decade. So it's different. Right. It's definitely an adjustment. I remember when I, when I was younger that it was always like the savings bonds. Mm -hmm. um, or it, you put money in CDs and everybody, and like, there was no high yield savings account. It was just a savings account, right? Yeah. Like that was just standard. And there were such higher rates than we're, we're seeing now. Um, so yep. it's really interesting to see how those really are so, um, complimentary. So interesting. So let's talk about, let's talk about the, the rate hike here. So I hear you kind of saying that like the government doesn't have a lot of options of what they could do to kind of slow down this, this rapid growth that we're kind of seeing that's getting a little bit out of hand when it comes to inflation. So why is raising interest rates the way to do that? So it, it goes back to this intention to influence our behavior, right? Okay. Like if I am investing in my business to grow it, in order to grow that business, if I want to produce more widgets or if I want to serve more sandwiches, that usually means that I'm going to have to hire more people. Well, if I'm going to hire more people and there are only so many workers out there, in mm -hmm. order to attract that worker to my business away from the competitor, I got to pay up, right? So that person's going to feel the lure to come over to my business, but it's also going to mean my costs are going up. And so I think what the Fed wants is for me, Elise, to say, you know what, maybe this year in 2023, it doesn't make sense for me to take out a loan and invest in the growth of my business. Instead, what I'm going to do is just focus on the resources I have, maybe even cut costs where I can. And sometimes, oftentimes, that means potentially laying people off. And mm -hmm. that way you, one, create like a literal decline in demand for things like labor or mm -hmm. things like goods, which sometimes can become scarce. But on the other hand, you also get folks throughout the economy starting to feel like 
a little scared and hesitant and wanting to go into that preservation mode where you're shoring up funds for a rainy day rather than you know going out on a Friday night and having a big night out with your friends where you're spending the money that you have in your checking account rather than saving it. Right. But but that hurts all of us that are investors trying to buy rental properties. Well, right? yes. <laughs> um, which once again, I definitely understand it still fits in the category. We are the, the owners of our rental property business. So same thing when we're talking about wanting to expand what our portfolios are, it fits in that same category as me as an employer looking to hire people where it's really saying like, hey, now is not the time to do that. Let's hold off a right. little bit. Gotcha. How did, I don't know if you know the answer to this, but I'm still going to ask it. The rate increase that we've seen, how is that determined on, you know, every other month we're going to increase rates and what percentage those are increased? How does that come about? Yep. So another great question and <laughs> something I don't usually get to talk about in such a fun <laughs> way. Um, the Fed every single year, right? They've got a set meeting calendar. So we as investors know when the Fed is formally going to sit down, have their little chat, and ultimately make a decision about where they think policy rates should be. Mm -hmm. They have this concept of something called the neutral rate, right? Which is that rate, which is supposed to neither stimulate economic activity by incentivizing people to borrow and spend, but also mm -hmm. not disincentivize people like we've been talking about. What the Fed has been trying to do this year is expeditiously move interest rates above that so-called neutral rate, which by the way, is fairly nebulous and can kind of change and fluctuate throughout the course of an economic cycle. But for our purposes, we can imagine that it's probably somewhere in the range of two to two and a half percent. So okay. what the Fed was trying to do was move fast without breaking too many things. So they started the year with like a first a 25 basis point rate hike, then it became 50. And then they did four, three quarters of a percentage point rate hikes. And then when they met in December at the, the last time we heard from the Fed, they're starting to slow that, that down. The reason why they're finally slowing down the pace of rate hikes is because now they've got their policy rate at four and a half percent very clearly in restrictive territory. And we actually need not look any further than the housing market for evidence mm -hmm. that like what they're doing is slowing activity down. Housing market being extremely in interest rate sensitive is almost always the first shoe to drop in the first place where the implications of this tighter monetary policy shows up. And so mm -hmm. I think at this point, the Fed understands, all right, we're seeing signs that what we're doing will be efficacious but we know other parts of the economy are going to be a little slower to respond because they're perhaps not as interest rate sensitive. So now looking forward, we want to move a little more slowly. So we went from 75 basis point rate increases to half a percentage point rate increase in December. We at JP Morgan think that they're probably just going to go by a quarter of a percentage point in, when they next meet on February 1st. Um, okay. And then thereafter, we actually think it's possible that like we might be done with rate hikes. They might pause for a Ooh. while. Not going to drop them, but you know, at the very least, not keep like dragging us higher. Okay. That was actually, you answered kind of two of my questions in there. So I want to break that down a little bit. So really what you're thinking, once again, don't have your crystal ball with you today. But what you're really thinking is then come February, we should see a small increase again in rate hikes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then for the rest of 2023, we feel fairly confident that rates will stay kind of where they are. Yes. Okay. So here's the other thing we need to remember. The, you, mm -hmm. the way that you and I and like investors feel what the Fed is doing isn't going to be one for one with what the Fed is actually doing in a given month. So right. interest rates moved higher really, really quickly in 2022, not just because the Fed was coming out, you know, nearly every month and increasing their policy rate, but also because investors, the market, were looking forward and projecting how high the Fed was going to take interest rates. So gotcha. at this point, right, we mm -hmm. do think that the Fed's policy rate could move a little bit higher from where it is today. Right. That said, though, interest rates, how we feel them, regardless if we're thinking about, you know, investing in bonds or if we're thinking about mortgage rates, mm -hmm. they actually could move lower, even as the Fed's policy rate stays at that elevated level. 
And the reason why they could start moving lower, like we think mm -hmm. they will throughout 2023, is because the market and economic participants are going mm -hmm. to start thinking about what comes after this rate hiking cycle, which probably is going to be recession. And once mm -hmm. the economy goes into recession, usually the Fed's reaction function, even if not immediately, is to cut those interest rates. So in anticipation of Fed rate cuts to come, interest mm -hmm. rates can start edging lower before the Fed is actually moving their policy rate in that direction. Gotcha. So there is a chance to see lower interest rates for mortgages later on in 2023. I think so. And like, again, let's go back to the fourth quarter of 2022. Mm -hmm. I don't need to tell you, I probably don't need to tell anyone listening to this podcast that in October and November, we saw at national average mortgage rates hanging out above 7% like for the first time in over 20 years. Since then, though, those mortgage rates have already started to come down right alongside things like treasury yields. And I think that that is a direct reflection of the dynamic I just talked about, which is the market starting to sniff out that we're closer to the end than we are to the beginning of this rate hiking cycle. Gotcha. That's very helpful. Okay. So there, there is hope from some of our, for some of our listeners out there that are hoping totally. for kind of a change in mortgage rates. When we talk about those mortgage rates though, and those kind of coming back down, can we make it clear? Are we looking at like, Hey, we should be back in like low sixes, high fives, or should we be like, Oh yeah, we're going to get back to those twos and threes that we saw back in 2020. Look, it's, it's possible. It will probably be a long time. And by long time, I say well over a year before we ever could hope to see mortgage rates back with like a two handle or even a three handle, because what the Fed has mm -hmm. made very, very clear is while inflation is already starting to fall, their number one objective right now is to make sure that they get inflation down and that it stays there. So they have communicated to us that even as the economy starts to slow, they're not just going to immediately cut their interest rates back to zero like they did in 2020 in response to the pandemic. So do we expect mortgage rates could potentially be lower one year from now? Yes. Do we necessarily think that mortgage rates are going to go back to where they were in 2020, 2021 anytime soon? Not necessarily, but I would encourage anyone thinking through this to not just consider interest rates in absolute terms, but really mm -hmm. in relative terms, right? Going back to that cost of capital concept, think through what it is that like it's going to cost you every single month to make those payments on the mortgage, but also think through and take like a lot of scrutiny in terms of what potential return you might be able to use on the investment that you're going to make with those proceeds. Because if right. between the income generation and the potential price appreciation that you can get from that investment is above that cost of capital, it still might make sense to you know take out the loan and invest even today with mortgage rates about 6%. Right, one, there's still deals to be made, right? There's, exactly. there's still money that can be made with real estate. And then also there is the idea back in, Back in 2020, people didn't want to buy. We were in the middle of the pandemic. We didn't know what that was going to look like. 2021, mm -hmm. people didn't want to buy because housing prices were really high. Now, all of a sudden, we're in 2022. Now, we don't want to buy because interest rate, right? So, like, right. It's a, it is an idea that, like, we can't necessarily always wait and continue to sit around and wait for the perfect storm to be able to buy a property because, honestly, we're probably never going to get there. There are many right. cogs to this wheel that we have to consider, we just have to be smart about it and we really need to evaluate the current situation that we're in. So mm -hmm. rate hikes, higher interest rates are really just something that we have to learn how to mitigate along with the other factors of what we're buying. Totally. Gotcha. And look, I would also encourage people like be assertive, be rational and just really kind of advocate for yourself and make sure you're taking a beat and kind of thinking through you know, if you're going to buy a property, yes, that cost of capital sort of calculus is super important. But mm -hmm. now, especially that we're already starting to see housing market activity soften so much, if something feels like it's a bargain, because maybe relative to comparable sales in the past six to 12 months, or relative to what the initial price was, and now it's been marked down, like, make sure that it's actually a bargain and that you're actually getting, getting a good deal and that those markdowns or like the attractive comps aren't just a reflection of the fact that that particular property was overvalued or overinflated 
as a result of the you know dynamics that we've seen in the market over the past couple of years. Correct. There is still that idea. Once again, now all of a sudden interest rates dramatically drop. Not only are other investors that have been waiting now three years to go buy a property, they're going to want to get back out in that market and go buy. But also a lot of the other people that haven't been able to purchase their forever home, their primary residence, are also going to start shopping again. They're going to be paying totally. these kind of record high rental prices. They've been going through this whole this whole spout with inflation and, and higher cost of goods and services. Anyways, they're going to now say, great, now that interest rates, interest rates are lower, we're going to be back kind of where we started. Interest rates are now going to lower. All these people are going to go back out shopping. Things are going to be more competitive. We're then either going to see sale prices going back up, or we're going to end up seeing the same competitions that we've seen with bidding wars and, and anything else right. and waiving contingencies that we saw in 2020 and 2021. Those are going to start to come back. Yep. Gotcha. So really, if you're listening to this, it's kind of a pick your battle scenario, yes. <laughs> right? Do we want to deal with the bidding wars and the high sale prices, or do we want to deal with um, higher interest rates? So I think that yep. just kind of goes to the idea that we have to continue to um, problem solve as real estate investors and sort out what is really going to be the best way that we can get in the game and make it make financial sense for us and for the outcome that we're really looking for in our purchases. Um I love that. It's kind of like a choose your own adventure. If you've ever read those books out there. Um. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And look, I do a lot of work with folks who are investing in public markets like stocks and bonds. And one of the mm -hmm. general rules of thumbs it, or rules of thumb is don't try to time the market. Um, I think given the illiquidity of the real estate market, like there perhaps could be some prudence in trying to time things a little bit. But remember that if you're taking a multi-year perspective, there are also these reasons to believe that property prices, while they should soften, given that things got a little overinflated during the you know, housing market boom of the past couple of years, there are reasons to believe that property prices could stay well-supported and even continue to increase from here. And that's largely a function of the fact that supply is still really, really constrained. I mean, relative to what our project projections suggest that housing stock should be, we're probably underbuilt by something like a million and a half homes on a national wow. level. So I don't think we should expect like, you know, a big price correction that gives us this screaming buy opportunity. Um, so just keep that in mind and, and don't get too cute about trying to time the market, so to speak. Right. No, if, if it's the same way in the housing market as it does with, with stocks and everything else. Um, you know, there are people out there that are kind of looking for this impending doom, the 2008 all over again, um, is that when we talk about recession, one, can we kind of put a definition to a recession and what that really looks like, and then talk about maybe what the difference would be between, should people wait for this, you know, apocalyptic 2023, like 2020, like 2008 worse, or what can we really kind of expect from what that would look like this time around? Sure. So there is this conventional textbook definition of recession that says it is constituted as two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. And if we were purely going off of that definition, then you could say that the United States was already in recession in 2022, because in the first and second quarter of last year, we saw mm -hmm. economic activity contract. That said, though, we think it's a pretty reductive definition, because when you look at these historical recessions, the other defining characteristics mostly involve things like an increase in unemployment, which we have mm -hmm. not seen yet. The labor market is still remarkably resilient and also a rise in things like corporate bankruptcies. So in terms of what it is that we'll see that'll finally cause us to put that flag in the ground and say, OK, we're in it. It's here. The recession, it is going to be a thing or something like you know, uh, an increasingly weak labor market, which is mm -hmm. something the Fed has said that they're actually looking for in this battle against inflation, and also a rise in, you know, credit defaults or potential bankruptcies. That right. said, though, we don't think, answering your question, that this is going to look like 2008, largely because the financial health of the United States in aggregate is so much stronger. Starting with the banking system itself, right, heading into the global financial crisis, the amount of loans that all of the banks in aggregate had on their balance sheets relative to the amount of deposits they had, it was one for one. That ratio was 100%. Wow. 
Today, that ratio or um, that ratio is just 70%. So banks have kind of delevered their balance sheets, suggesting that you know, even if we do start to feel some financial strain, the banks are going to hold up fine. And like, they're still going to be there tomorrow. The money you have in your checking account, you're still going to be able to go to an ATM and withdraw. Beyond that, and digging into like the key economic players, you've got the corporate sector and you've got mm -hmm. we, the consumers. Corporate sector has actually also done a really good job of kind of putting itself on better financial footing. What we mm -hmm. saw during the pandemic era when interest rates were at those all-time lows were a lot of executives who took the opportunity to lock in cheap financing by issuing mm -hmm. debt at those ultra low interest rate levels. And so now their debt burdens, the amount of interest they have to pay versus the income they have coming in, that's in the strongest shape that we've seen in decades. Same thing goes for consumers, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I know that the ma majority of household debt is in the housing sector, about 70% in total. And versus the global financial crisis, you've seen the median FICO score of mortgage holders increase. Um, you've got uh, people with more equity in general in their homes. And when we look at the effective mortgage rate, like what arms and lakes people have locked in, that's actually below three and a half percent. So just because the cost of a new mortgage has increased so much, there are a lot of folks out there who actually still have this relatively affordable debt on their balance sheet that they really have no problem servicing because they too are benefiting from that wage inflation and they've got mm -hmm. the money coming in the door to continue to pay that debt. Interesting. Okay. You know, I think that's going to be something that's a little bit like newer for some of us is kind of now looking at what this recession is going to be like for us. Um, and that, that does really help. A lot of people, once again, are kind of sitting there being like, I'm going to sit in my cash. It's going to be just like 2008. Everything's going to just kind of blow up. And it's really nice to kind of know that that's not, that's not really what we're looking at in this similar situation. Totally. Gotcha. Okay. Um, what should the, what should us as real estate investors kind of be concerned with or kind of have in our minds now entering 2023? Yeah, so I would say three things. And I think I've actually kind of touched on all three of these things. The first one is make sure you're approaching the market with scrutiny. Second one is to take a local perspective and not just think about kind of countrywide dynamics. And the third one is thinking about your cost of capital in relative terms. So if I can double click on each one, starting with number one, approaching the market with scrutiny, it goes mm -hmm. back to that idea of just making sure that if something feels like a bargain or a really good deal, that it actually is. Be really right. careful about comparing a property value to you know comparable properties that have sold in the past six to 12 months, because there's a good chance that those prices might have been overinflated and that whatever the current price is, maybe is just fair value for that particular market. Um, mm -hmm. Honing in on number two, the reason why I say to take a more local perspective is because what we have seen in the national housing market since the pandemic, it hasn't been uniform, right? You've had some areas of the country that just absolutely exploded as people migrated from these high cost, you know, metropolitan type areas like San Francisco or New York City and decided to go mm -hmm. to like, I don't know, Austin, Texas. So maybe Austin, as an example, is more overvalued than a market like New York City. So even if you don't feel equipped to have those kind of boots on the ground insights or that, that local perspective, I would encourage you to leverage your network and find someone who you can trust and who will be objective in order to get it, to really have a sense of like what specific market you're actually buying into. And then right. third and finally, you know, thinking through that cost of capital, yes, interest rates are high in absolute terms, especially when we're thinking about them in comparison to what we had in 2020 and 2021. But if you think that between the potential income generation from this property and or the potential price appreciation over whatever time horizon you currently have in mind for this investment, if you think that that return is going to be able to you know, beat the cost of your borrowing, then it might make sense to make the investment, even though interest rates are elevated. I, I once heard someone say, you know, remember that you can marry the house, but date the rate. And I love that. Like you always have the opportunity to refinance, but if you fall right. in love with a property or you think it's like really compelling as a long-term investment, don't let 
the the cost of borrowing deter you entirely. Right. I love that. Thank you so much for breaking that down, especially with what we can kind of expect in the new year. Um, this has been fantastic. I appreciate everything that you that you stated. It came from such a knowledgeable and educational place. Um, I, I enjoyed this episode a lot. I'm probably going to go back and re-listen to everything you said too. Um, but thank you very much, Lise. I really appreciate your time today and breaking this down for us. We're going to have to have you back on um, to kind of then talk about, you know, when we're halfway through the year and, and see where we kind of got. But this this was really great. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you for having me. And you've gotten me excited about the prospect of potentially being a property owner and a lady landlord. So thank you. Come join the community. We are, we are fun and friendly. You are welcome to join whenever you're ready. So thank you very much for being here. For all of our listeners, thank you again for listening to this week's episode of the Lady Landlords Podcast. Do make sure to hit subscribe if you are watching us on YouTube or wherever it is that you listen to podcasts as we release new episodes every single Tuesday. Thanks so much and see you next week for our next episode. Thank you for listening to today's episode. If you're feeling stuck in your real estate journey, visit lady-landlords.com to book a one-on-one -on -one workshop with me. I'll help you determine your next best strategy. Or you could subscribe to our newsletter for exclusive tips and offers. Invest with confidence, become a lady landlord today.